wonderful session of this workshop that you suggested. Uh, a diverse set of talks that have introduced us to some fascinating applications. And we're going to continue in that vein today with one of the most uh, fascinating and demanding computational problems around. Uh, our speaker is Professor Harvey Newman of Caltech, also associated with the Large Hadron Collider. And he's going to tell us about some of the frontiers of uh, elementary particle physics. Okay, well, uh, it's great to be here today to talk to you a little bit about the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, as you can see here, I've uh, started with some snapshots um, to show the trajectory of what we're doing. So what you can see on the left are a couple of candidate events, which were some of the uh, signals that were used, extracted from the data to do the Higgs boson discovery. In the middle, you see uh, the detector that I work on, the CMS detector, I know that I just met a member of the Atlas collaboration who's here in the audience. And I'll tell you about the Higgs discovery, what lies beyond, and uh, perhaps in the second part mostly I'll get into some of the data challenges and may, maybe we'll even have time uh, to talk about some of the applications of deep learning methods which are really having an impact on our field. We'll see how it goes. Uh, first thing to say is these are some of the young people in our research team. And these are the real heroes of this story who uh, are really the ones most responsible for much of the work and for the discoveries and applications of new methods. So what high energy physics is all about is to understand the most fundamental constituents of matter and the forces between them and also how our universe uh, has gotten to the present, namely what happened uh, at the origins uh, at and right after the Big Bang, how things have evolved, and whether or not the present physics that we see is the physics of the early universe as it was in the first moments. I think we can already say the answer to that question is no, that we have a great description of a lot of what's happening, but we know there are fundamental flaws and if we try to, to project back to the early moments of the universe, basically that picture is not only incomplete, but in some ways doesn't work at all. Uh, like some other disciplines, uh, this is uh, an area which attracts some of the very best young people uh, who really love to grapple with such fundamental questions. Being at Caltech is also great because there's a great theme of undergraduate research. So in our team over the years, we've had uh, well over 100 undergraduates who've made, in many cases, significant contributions to this. So uh, what we understand so far is a beautiful, simple picture. I tried to capture a lot of it here. Uh, many of you know that our understanding of matter includes three families of quarks, strongly interacting constituents <coughs> of matter, in which the first generation, the up and down quark shown in the upper left, is what constitutes normal matter. Uh, working with accelerators, people have discovered other generations. First, what's called the charm and strange quark. The strange quark in the 50s, then the charm quark, the third generation top and bottom quark. Um, these families are complemented by a set of families of what are called leptons, lepton for light. There are charged particles. The most familiar is the electron. In the 40s, the muon was discovered in 1975. The third charged <coughs> lepton, the tau particle, was discovered um, at the Stanford Linear Accelerator uh, Center, not far from here. And each of these leptons is accompanied by a different type of neutrino, very weakly interacting particles that escape our detectors without being uh, detected. And now there are specialized experiments that actually can, there are so many neutrinos in those that you can detect neutrino interactions. And uh, this is complemented by four force carriers. Um, for the fundamental interactions, we have the electromagnetic interaction, the weak interaction. Those two are unified in a very predictive uh, unified theory called the electroweak theory. And there's also the strong interaction. For example, that's the interaction responsible for binding nuclei together. 
uh, in which the quarks uh, participate. Uh, the weak interaction is carried by two heavy particles, the Z0, which has no electric charge, and the W, which is charged. Uh, in this picture, until recently, until a few years ago, the missing element was the Higgs boson, which is thought to give uh, matter to elementary <coughs> particles. Um, and now, in a restricted sense, that theory is completed. However, the standard model has a number of uh, shortcomings. It doesn't include a quantum description of gravity. Um, it doesn't have a candidate for what makes up the dark matter in the universe. If you project it back to the early moments, I already said, not only do the forces of nature not unify, do they come to a single uh, original force, but the theory doesn't work anymore, at least the way we understand it. Um, we don't understand why there's so much more matter than antimatter in the universe, not really. <coughs> We don't know where the pattern of particle masses comes from, and we have no idea what to say about dark energy. Being a particle physicist, you expect that it's made up of particles, but we actually cannot prove that. So we have this beautiful, simple picture, and so many questions are unanswered. And related to that, maybe you've heard talks about astrophysics and cosmology. Um, although we understand much about matter, 95% of the matter in our universe and energy is unknown to us. So uh, being from Caltech, uh, this picture uh, of relativistic quantum field theories which describe uh, these interactions started with, uh, uh, with Feynman, who there you see him lecturing at Caltech in 1960. Um, and he's the one who came up with quantum molecular dynamics after taking 12 years to prove that his thesis advisor was completely wrong, which I think is a great lesson for, for students. Uh, then after that is the whole uh, arc of unifying electromagnetic and weak interactions. The three gentlemen, Glashow, Weinberg, Weinberg, Salam, and Glashow are shown uh, there. And that also uh, introduced the concept, which I'll say more of, of what's called um, electroweak symmetry breaking. The third interaction, the, the strong interaction, actually fits into the same framework, but how to do that theoretically was a mystery until in the 2000s, uh, some young physicist, uh, including one who's in my building, David Politzer, came up with the idea of asymptotic freedom, namely that quarks, although they interact strongly when they're produced in an interaction or at small distances, the strength of the interaction goes down. So you can use the same, what's called perturbative framework to calculate things to, uh, to subsequent orders and come up with uh, reliable predictions. And it's the Higgs boson that's supposed to be the source of electroweak symmetry breaking. Uh, this is just a picture of it because uh, when we go through some of the signatures, this is uh, a great way to introduce it. Uh, so when quarks or gluons, which uh, bind uh, particles, strongly interacting particles, when quarks uh, <coughs> emerge from the interaction point, the greater and greater distances, Instead of the force between, between them getting weaker, it gets stronger. And eventually it becomes so strong and the energy density is so high that additional particles are produced from the vacuum. And instead, like in the picture on the right from a previous experiment that was on, you see these jets of particles come out. So we don't see quarks and gluons in nature, but instead we see their fragments, the jets, which appear in our detectors. And so I put together, uh, here's some vignettes. There's the Nobel Prize for my colleague. In the middle is the, my reporting of the discovery of gluons experimentally at a conference at Fermilab, um, which I reported in 1979. And the, some of the first color graphics displays, which show these jets from my first uh, graduate student. Okay, so about the Higgs discovery, until July 4th, 2012, this was the only Higgs known, Peter Higgs, <laughs> visiting our experiment. But experiments until that time had already made searches and they could exclude more and more of the possible mass ranges. And so by the time the discovery claimed there was only this narrow uh, region left in which it could be. And then on July 4th, of course, it was discovered. So it was discovered on July 4th, 2012. By March 2013, people were convinced this is 
the Higgs boson predicted by the standard model of particle physics. And it was a wonderful time in our field because it wasn't only a discovery in physics, it seemed to have been taken as an achievement of humanity, a worldwide phenomenon. And uh, for example, as the, these things were going on, about a billion people watched this. In terms of science, the theory was first uh, postulated not only by Higgs, but others, Angler and Braut, at about the same time. In 1964, then the experiments to go after this among, and to look at the high energy frontier for things beyond the standard model. Uh, those concepts were put forward in 1984, studied, the detector designs were developed, construction began in 2001, we started taking data in 2009, and we had the discovery in 2012. Uh, one thing I wanted to emphasize, because I also work a lot on uh, data networks, is advanced computational methods and networks are essential for the discovery, but for every, also every PhD thesis of the last 20 years in this program, and for all of the discoveries to come. Now, before I get into the Higgs discovery a bit, I want to emphasize that the mission of the LHC is not that. That was the first mission, but the real mission is to use it as a discovery machine. So the LHC collides protons at the highest possible energy um, head-on, where the bunches of protons in the machine, as you'll see, cross at a number of points. And by doing that, what we really are doing is colliding the constituents of the protons, the quarks and the gluons which are inside the protons. And what matters in, in terms of producing something new is the center of mass energy that you have uh, available to produce new things. So uh, on this uh, log plot, you look at what's called a parton-parton center of energy, where a parton could be a quark or a gluon. If you look at the previous uh, highest energy accelerator, the Tevatron at Fermilab, uh, which stopped operating just a couple of years ago, uh, it cuts off at about 1,000 GeV or 1 TeV equivalent energy in the center of mass frame, and the LHC goes out to several TeV. Now, when we started this program, we had these very strong biases, and we still have the residual part of that bias, which is that we knew what was beyond the standard model, namely a very appealing theory called supersymmetry, which unifies the symmetries of particle physics in space-time, has a dark matter candidate, would work in the early universe, is stable at high energies, and all these things. But until now, unlike our expectations, is not there. So we really are searching uh, in the unknown. Maybe it's still possible that supersymmetry exists. Shorthand Susie. Are there substructures of quarks and gluons? Are there other high energy particles, resonances of other interactions? For example, uh, does gravity become uh, strong at, at an energy scale we can access? Are there microscopic black holes? We don't think so, fortunately. And other exotic uh, things. We don't know what we're going to find. Uh, the good news is that since our early expectations have not been realized, when we do learn something in this uh, class of wonderful possible things, it will revolutionize our thinking. Oh, the shortest possible summary is this. Nature is more subtle. Uh, another way to put it is Einstein used to say, I like to look in the face of God. The answer is, unfortunately, she's a lot smarter than you are. So how does the Higgs boson work? So uh, we say it brings mass to uh, elementary particles. So there was a competition to explain it to the public. And this is one of the winning explanations. So imagine you have the vacuum, and it's represented. In the vacuum, there are all these fluctuations. So you can imagine if you take a snapshot, you'll see all these particles living for an instant. And imagine you can represent them by all these uh, people, a room full of uh, physicists at a cocktail party, and they're kind of moving around and uh, in this picture talking to each other like the, all of space figs <laughs> uh, filled with the Higgs field. And then if a well-known scientist, uh, there's uh, Albert Einstein, walks in, they all cluster around him. So the Higgs field clusters around uh, a particle and he becomes very massive and he can hardly move. And so this resistance to movement is somehow analogous to how 
uh, particles acquire mass. There are similar things in uh, condensed matter physics. You can even find things that an electron moving in a solid in the Feynman lectures, sometimes it behaves like it has many electron volts of equivalent energy and not, not just half, an, uh, of an, um, half of an MeV. OK, so there is this concept of um, spontaneous <coughs> symmetry breaking. This is something which is familiar in nature. What it says is that if I have a fundamental theory, the ground state doesn't have to necessarily respect the symmetries which appear to be evident in the theory. So for example, uh, if I, have, I, I turn on a magnet or a piece of iron becomes magnetized, it picks uh, a particular direction, even though the interaction doesn't have a particular direction, but all the domains tend to line up in some direction or if I put water on a glass pane and cool it down until it freezes, although it's a smooth surface, suddenly all these uh, wonderful patterns of ice crystals with symmetries appear. So what happens here is that the lowest state of the vacuum is not at zero field. If uh, you represent it here, it's a so-called, it's called a sombrero potential. Namely, there is a field, it has a real and imaginary part, and if you say, where's the minimum of this uh, field, this minimum of this potential? It's at some uh, finite value of the field corresponding to a certain non-zero mass. And the spontaneous symmetry breaking part is where, in the azimuthal direction on this sombrero, do you end up so it spontaneously picks a certain direction. There's already a hint of a problem here. Now that we've discovered the Higgs boson to be at 125 GV, if you try to carefully use your theory to project backward in time, which is equivalent to projecting to very high energies, you find that the self-coupling of this field suddenly goes negative. What does that mean? It means that we wouldn't be living in a real vacuum, that we would transition to something else and we wouldn't be here. But we did get here, didn't we? From the Big Bang till now. And so there's a question of what's going on here. If the Higgs boson is that light, Maybe something else happens. There's an intermediate mass scale between the energy of the Big Bang uh, right after the Big Bang, let's say 10 to the 16 GV, and where we are now, and maybe something else is happening. <coughs> OK, experimentally. So uh, maybe uh, you've heard talks about the Large Hadron Collider before, for those of you who haven't. This is a picture uh, taken from a helicopter down on the topography of Switzerland and France. Uh, the accelerator, the LHC, which uh, accelerates and then collides bunches of protons, is actually below the ground uh, in Switzerland and France at a depth of between 50 and 150 meters. Uh, you can see it's very large. It has a circumference of 27 kilometers. And if you look on your right, you see the Geneva airport. Very important. So um, you can also make out the fact that this is an accelerator complex. If you look carefully, you'll see that the ATLAS experiment um, is on the Swiss side. CMS is about 25 minutes away drive in France, and there are two other experiments. If you look carefully near ATLAS, you'll see there are smaller circles. Uh, there's a whole chain of accelerators starting from a hydrogen bottle uh, that where the uh, protons get accelerated. So there are four main LHC experiments, and there are also a couple of other specialized experiments. I'll talk mainly about the CMS experiment, which I uh, understand in the greatest detail. The keys to discovery here are two things. One, the highest possible energy, so we have a good probability of being able to produce events containing Higgs bosons and also intensity. There's a certain rate and you want to gain, get a big sample of events so that you can extract the signals and then study them and understand whether the standard model is telling you all about the means by which the uh, particles are produced and how they decay into the final state particles that you measure. This is how uh, the LHC uh, works. Um, you can compare the design values in terms of the number of uh, bunches in the machine, uh, how many protons are in a bunch, the beam energy. And what's most important to us is you can think of the intensity. It's called the luminosity. For a process which has a given predicted rate, 
we express it in what's called a cross section, how many events do you get? There was a design luminosity which people thought was just a reach. I mean, in the, some units, it's 10 to the 34 per centimeter square per second. For example, if you talk about strong, the strong interaction and how many uh, interactions you get when the particles collide, 10 to the 34 would be about 10 to the, not, 10 to the 9 interactions per second. And in fact, amazingly to us, we've gone beyond that. Um, actually, the experiments have been running can only take so much in terms of the complexity of event, events, uh, what's called a pileup. Every time two bunches cross, you don't get one interaction, you get many, even though they cross uh, for a fraction of a nanosecond every 25 nanoseconds, within that, that interval, uh, you get many interactions. And that number has gone up to 50 or 60 at the highest luminosities. OK, so as shown at the top, uh, there's actually a common ring of magnets with two places for the beams. Uh, bunches of protons counter-rotate. And at four points around the ring, come together and the bunches pass through each other. <coughs> Every once in a while, a proton in one bunch collides with a proton in the other. As I said, what you really are colliding are quarks and gluons. And then you see these final state particles. The most common thing you see are uh, lots of particles, jets of particles. And then there are more rare things. And I'll say more about that later. But way down in this uh, sequence, rather rare events, you can produce Higgs bosons. And for the rare decays of the Higgs boson, sometimes we're looking at one event in 10 to the 14. OK, so to do this program, we need this large accelerators, such as the LHC uh, detectors, which are also instruments of remarkable complexity to uh, record and differentiate the types of particles coming out from the interaction region, looking at the energies, the topology, and characteristics of the events to uh, characterize what we know more precisely and extract new things, new physics processes. Uh, computing grids, um, the only way that you can analyze all the data, it's done cooperatively at sites around the world. There are currently um, about 300 sites, uh, 13 national centers, about 160 centers which are dimensioned that can be run at the smaller labs and universities. And every physics group has a cluster, and there are about 300 of those. So the task there is to, uh, to collect, uh, store, distribute, and analyze collaboratively lots of data, and of course, people. Uh, physicists, uh, engineers, technologists, all working together. OK, how the, does the detector work? As I said there are particular points around the ring where the bunches of protons cross. Around those points, that's where you install your detection apparatus. And simply said, uh, there are multiple layers in this detection apparatus which are specialized to uh, detect different types of particles. And we'll so go through that in some detail. We have to differentiate by making measurements in the different layers uh, photons, electrons, muons, quarks, which you see as jets of particles. And in addition, neutrinos, which are sometimes produced as part of the interaction or the decay of some of the particles, they escape from the detector uh, unseen. And so if you try to balance, in, at least in the transverse direction, remember the quarks and gluons can have some longitudinal momentum because although the protons have a total momentum of zero, a pair of protons, the quarks and gluons are not necessarily. But in the transverse plane, transverse to the beam line, you should have a balance of momentum and energy. And if you don't see that, the, the most probable thing in a standard event is from neutrinos. And then for new physics signatures, we look for events with lots of missing energy in the transverse plane. OK, so here, um, so this is on, at the top a picture of the CMS uh, detector and has various uh, layers. An inner tractor, which is made up of uh, first pixels and then silicon strips, uh, which detects par charged particle tracks. Uh, then there are crystals, an array of crystals, 76,000 crystals weighing about 90 tons, which makes precise measurements of electrons and photons. And then outside that, 
is a superconducting coil which provides a magnetic field, a strong magnetic field to bend charged particles and allow them, allow us to momentum analyze them. Um, oh yes, and then also I didn't mention there's also what's called the Hadron calorimeter. Uh, after the electrons and photons are absorbed in the crystals, then uh, the most copious particles like pions and kaons deposit some of the energy in the crystals and some in the next layer called the Hadron calorimeter. And again, what's happening is we're absorbing the energy and then in layers interleave with a heavy material, we're able to sample the energy and get a measure of the incoming energy of individual particles. Outside the coil, there are then layers uh, which are iron to return the high magnetic field flux and multiple stations of what we call muon chambers, which give us uh, coordinates in space so we can see the particles called muons, which don't interact strongly. Unlike the electron, they're a bit heavier, so they manage to get to the outside. And seeing them inside and outside like that tells you uh, that it's a muon. So I have a, a little uh, animation here. You can see a muon that goes from the inside to the outside and measured in the multiple stations of the muon chambers, an electron. You see the tracks formed and then essentially it's stopped. There's a cascade in the crystals and all the energy is absorbed there. A neutral hadron, no track in the inside, but then interacting strongly in the hadron calorimeter. A charged hadron, like a pion or a kaon. track inside and then depositing a lot of its energy in the hadron calorimeter and a photon which of course has no charge so it doesn't deposit anything in the inner layers and it gets absorbed in the crystals. So those are some of the basic patterns that we use to distinguish particles and a lot more analysis than that. One thing to say about electrons and photons is when they're absorbed in the crystals the pattern among the many crystals each of which is only two by two centimeters in cross-section is characteristically narrow. Uh, the energy is deposited, deposited in only a few crystals. And that tells you, helps you distinguish electrons and photons from uh, charged hadrons. Um, as time went on, by about 2011 to 12, the time of the discovery, instead of just using the characteristics in the different layers, we started to use them all together. There was this uh, global event reconstruction, which we call particle flow, which was using all the information in the, in the different layers to come up with what are called reconstructed particles, electrons, muons, photons, charged and neutral hadrons, and then to use them as building blocks from which you could say that these are jets of particles, that there's some missing uh, transverse energy, maybe a sign of new physics or just the usual effect of neutrinos in the event. We could build uh, heavy leptons ha do have a characteristic signature, <coughs> what are called the tau leptons, and try to pick out isolated leptons because when an, a lepton, like an electron or a muon, is isolated from many of the other particles, that's also part of what could be a new uh, particle signature. It helps us differentiate. Um, as the intensity of the machine increased, so did the amount of pileup, and I'll show you more about that. And so one of the motivations for this particle flow code was to minimize the impact on the basic objects. When we reconstruct jet energies, when we identify and, and measure the energies of lep leptons or photons and say how isolated they are, we have to remove the effect of an increasing amount of pileup. For every event of interest, uh, we started in 2011, they were accompanied by a few other interactions maybe rather well separated in terms of where along the bunching, uh, the bunch crossing uh, region where they occurred. But as the intensity went up, that went to 20 and then to 40 and 50. And I must say the original design said we would have to deal with 17. And so now we're dealing with 50 to 60. And eventually in the second phase of the program called the Large Hadron, the High Luminosity Large Hadron Collider, starting around 2026 for a decade, we have to deal with up to 200. 
So what you could see, this is at the time of the discovery, we could show that as a function, the number of vertices that we could maintain the muon isolation, identification at the bottom, we could maintain the high resolution for, um, for photons at the bottom. This is a picture in a time-lapse picture of our detector being built which took about six years. That's my colleague, Maria, who talked in February. And um, what's particular about our experiment is it has these, it's very modular, and so large pieces could be pre-assembled, pre-commissioned on the surface, and lowered down. And um, the pieces going down, a 2,000 ton crane would lower it down, would take about 11 hours to go the 50 meters to the ground. This is the superconducting coil in the heaviest piece, which is 2,000 tons, and there's the arrival of the heaviest piece. Um, this is the most ambitious magnet ever built. Fortunately, it works. Uh, and so it generates a four Tesla field. We, we operate it a little bit less because every once in a while, not very often, it quenches, and there's a, its life is only so many quenches. We run it a bit below four Tesla, below about 40 kilogauss. Uh, when it's excited, the, pressure, the radial pressure is 64 atmospheres. If you calculate the, the energy stored in the magnetic field, it's comparable to the heaviest, the kinetic energy of an aircraft carrier uh, moving at about 20 miles an hour. Uh, one thing that we've worked on uh, among these many detectors in our lab at Caltech is crystals. We've developed these heavy scintillating crystals for various experiments, which are an important part of the discovery. So signatures involving electrons and muons are among the most distinctive features uh, that there are. We also have built a laser monitoring system. While the crystals are sitting in the radiation environment of the LHC, they undergo changes. Uh, what happens is the crystals which contain defects and or impurities, what's formed under ionizing radiation are called color centers and the color centers change the transparency of the crystals. And so every 40 minutes, we check or measure the transparency of each of the 76,000 crystals. This is the laser. Okay, now what about uh, the data readout? Well, as you saw, CMS is a highly heterogeneous system. If you count the number of electronics channels, including the innermost pixel detector, which has a lot of those channels, the total is about 100 million and you're sampling about every 25 nanoseconds. The data flow from the detector is of order one petabit a second. And after pre-filtering with hardware and then filtering with uh, many uh, processors in real time, we end up, there's about 50 exabytes a day in readout and online processing thro flowing through this system. Uh, I already mentioned this is capturing what's happened with the luminosity. Uh, this is a record from not quite all of last year in Atlas and CMS. Um, this is showing about 80% of uh, what was collected. And um, oh, this is from 2016 going to 2017, I see. So the amazing thing, like I said, is a machine is really capable of twice the design luminosity. And uh, we run a little bit less than that. The beams are actually separated just a bit so we run at about one and a half times design luminosity uh, so that we get cleaner data. Uh, so this year is going to be a production year. Um, there are some small problems. Well, for physicists, weren't so small. But in the accelerator, there were problems that uh, forced us to use less than the highest number of events. Those problems are now resolved, we think. And this is going to be a production year. We're getting a lot of data. So this illustrates uh, increasing numbers of pileup. Uh, starting in 2010, the average number of pileup events was two. In 2011, seven at the time of the discovery, uh, up to about 20. In 2016, 30. 2017, 40 to 50. And then you can see on the right some of the, see many tracks coming out. And in the, on the right in the center, and then you can also see, if you look in the calorimeter layers, how the energy is deposited. So as we get this enormous data sample, which gives us a great opportunity for 
scientific discovery, we have to deal with more and more complexity. So this is a plot that's just to illustrate some of the things. There are more than 10 to the 9 interactions per second. Um, on this plot, this would be up off at the top on these units about, uh, it's about 10 to the 11 on this plot. And you can see that some of the interesting events get down to 0 0.1 units. In the rarest of case, from the total number of interactions to the rarest interactions, there's about 14 orders of magnitude. OK, so now what, a little bit about the data taking. First, there is what's called the trigger system. In CMS, the second level is really done with, with uh, general purpose processors. The first level is uh, hardware, where we take the digital data and parts of the detector, actually slices of parts of the detector, the data which is um, then digitized and digital data is looked for patterns. Events are built from the various parts and you do a pre-selection. Finally, uh, from the hardware trigger comes out about 100 kilohertz. Uh, in the next phase, it'll be raised to about 750 kilohertz as the limit. And then you make, uh, you make selections deciding which data to keep. So there are tens of thousands of computing cores in our higher level triggers and about a couple of hundred trigger lines of what we're going to, to keep, uh, essentially filtering uh, algorithms and pieces of code. And we typically record about a gigabyte a second now. And then considering that we run for something like uh, 4 million seconds a year, uh, that's a lot of data. Okay, so in dealing with this data, uh, I was faced with this problem in 1999, and so I came up with this cartoon, which is how the data would be handled, namely by a worldwide grid of facilities. So data flows from the experiment through the trigger system, record about a gigabyte a second after filtering in multiple stages, first processed at the laboratory at CERN, then sent to about 13 national centers. Over networks which have expanded in capability over, over the years, now the current generation of networks, typical long-range long wide area links are about 100 gigabits a second. And then in this simple picture, which is really not the picture, I'll explain in a moment, um, data from there would be processed further at what are called the tier two centers. And there are now about 170 of those. And then from there, the, the clusters used by the individual uh, groups. So the idea functionally is that at the laboratory site, you, at the experiment, you do real-time data processing. At the national centers called tier one, you do data and simulation. Now that's also migrated to many of the tier two sites. And at the tier two and tier three sites is the main place where analysis is done. Since this simple picture, by the way, this simple cartoon went over very well with the CERN managers who thought it was all a kind of well-managed system. Of course, the physicists say, you know, the hell with this. I mean, they just want to get their data samples and analyze them and the source can be really from anywhere. So now we have more of a mesh where if you're at your tier two or tier three site, you get your data from any one of a number of places and data flows over networks in much more complex ways. Um, so we needed this aggregate use of all these facilities to get all the data processed and analyzed. Lately, we realized that we're going to and starting to run out of uh, computing resources. So we also sometimes send some of the data into the cloud to overcome some of the peak needs. And there's this, this concept of any job anywhere, of trying to put jobs where there are computational resources and storage space available. So basically, now you've got this global dynamic system and how data flows and how to get the, the work done, namely how to optimize the workflow, is a big problem. And so uh, I'm deeply involved in developing uh, advanced network systems to help with this. But in the end, once we create these mechanisms, there will be this problem of optimization where 
some of the modern methods um, in deep learning could be very applicable. Okay, so I wanted to finish to, to keep on the physics for a while, but I did want to mention, um, so you've got this picture of global uh, data flow at an expanding rate. It's growing exponentially. Um, I'll come back to that. I mean, for example, right now we have about half of an exabyte stored among the sites. And so it's challenging the world's networks. Um, and so we're developing systems which, uh, to handle this. And eventually, as I said, we want to use deep learning. One thing I haven't touched upon, and we're not into it yet, but I must say, even if we manage to do that, the final step in this process is to find stable solutions. Namely, if I have, let's say, of order 200 sites, I can derive what I think is optimal according to a simple metric, like the speed of processing the data. But there are other factors, like fair sharing, and um, also justifying the existence of certain facilities so you can't starve any. So it's a problem which requires stable solutions, you know, like Nash equilibrium or not coming up with solutions which the next day you have a revolution. Okay, so back to physics. Um, so let's go through some of the things that led to the discovery about the Higgs boson. Um, so the first thing is how are Higgs bosons produced? Uh, within the protons, there are constituents called gluons, uh, which bind the uh, quarks in the protons together, and it's those that are most frequently the ones which uh, interact. So you can see the highest curve is telling you the rate of production of, of Higgs particles. Uh, for Higgs, well, we, we happen now we plot them for a Higgs mass of 125 GeV because we know that's what its mass is. And so the, the uh, most frequent process is called gluon fusion, where two gluons come together, and then through this process, which is shown in the upper right, involving what we call a quark loop, then you can get a, a Higgs boson. Um, there are other processes. So what can happen is a quark and anti quark are, are a quark, two quarks are going along. They each radiate um, a weak boson, like a W. So I can get two Ws, I get Zs, and they can fuse together on the, on the uh, left to form a Higgs boson that's down by about an order of magnitude. Uh, although it's rarer, those things, because there are also two leftover quarks which form two jets, that's more distinctive, and so the signal to background ratio can be larger. Similarly, if we create a Higgs, as shown in the green over there on the right, um, we'll have left over in this rare signature what's called an, a vector boson, a W or a Z. And if that decays into involving elect electrons or muons, that also gives a, a better signature. So we get a rarer process, but a larger signal to background ratio. And then finally, in the lower left, you see what is called a TT bar Higgs. Well, a Higgs particle uh, associated with a pair of top quarks. And the top quark decays also give you some distinction. That's much rarer. It's down by a good two orders of magnitude from the most common production mode. But it's distinctive and can also tell you how heavy quarks, like top quarks, whether they uh, coupled to the Higgs in just the way you expect. The other thing that's shown is as the energy of the machine went up from the first cycle of running called Run 1 in 2009 to 2012 to Run 2, the energy went up. And so the production rates, you see the numbers, went up for different processes by two to four times. Excuse me, what is, what is the scale, y axis scale? Uh, one second. Um, so this is the cross section for producing the Higgs in pico barns. So if you want to compare the rate, one way to think about it is the basic interaction, let's say, of proton-proton um, collisions at these energies is about 100 millibarns, okay, or about um, these are pico barns. So if I compare 100 millibarns, it's 10 to the 11 times um, a pico barn. Okay. So 
So these are units of picobarns or 10 to the minus 12 barns. The strong interaction, when the first people considered it, they wanted to express it as a cross-section equivalent to the, as an anal analogy, the area of a disk. So imagine you're kind of colliding things and you say, well, how often do things collide? Well, it depends upon the size of this disk. And the first thing was called a barn, like big, like the side of a barn, which is 10 to the minus 24 centimeter square. And this is a pico barn, the units is 10 to the minus 36 centimeters square. And the Higgs production rate at, uh, at 13 TeV, where we're running now, is about 40 pico barn. So then, like, how often is the LHC finding these? Uh, you're actually asking two questions at once. The production of Higgs in all its decay modes is fairly large. Uh, overall now about 4 million Higgs bosons have been produced. However, to find them, uh, the main way to find them is through s these distinctive signatures. For example, there's one, there are two types of very important uh, decays, which I'll get to in a moment. Let me get to that. So once the Higgs is produced, it can decay in many ways. And what you can see on the left is the, um, the branching ratio. Of all the decays, what's the percentage that it decays in different ways? The most probable way, because the Higgs couples to mass, it likes to couple to the heaviest available particle, which is like a, a bottom quark, which is about six times the mass of a proton. So the largest branching ratio is to a Higgs, a bottom quark, an anti-bottom quark. But that res results in a couple of jets, and it's nearly impossible, not quite, but nearly impossible to pick out those events. So you have to focus, first of all, on rare decays. So what I've listed here is, with the Higgs being in the mass range that it is, it can decay significantly in many ways uh, to a pair of Z bosons, uh, which turns out to be important, you'll see in a moment, a pair of photons, uh, w particles, tau particles, or, or B, B quarks. The rare decays, the Higgs to, to two photons, which is about 0.2%, and then the Higgs going to two Z bosons, but we don't measure the Z bosons. We see the very distinctive signature where it goes into either E plus E minus, E plus E minus, or E plus E minus, U plus U minus. Those are very rare things, <coughs> only because on top of the Higgs production rate, the, each Z decay to a pair of leptons is only 3%. Overall, the whole process is only 0.01% of all the Higgs particles, but it's one of those channels which provides us the most information. And the other thing is that in these, these reactions where I have two photons or I have four leptons, I can measure all the energy in the event and I can reconstruct the invariant mass. And that's what gives us, gives me the most sensitive way to distinguish that there's a particular mass at which these things are being produced above the, the background, namely a resonance that you can see um, compared to the background. Uh, the next important thing is shown down there. You can produce a pair of W particles. It's good in that the W particles in these relatively rare decays can decay to leptons, but the point is you also have neutrinos, so you don't get a mass peak. So we look at all these things um, and test the couplings to all these processes. But in the discovery and understanding what the Higgs mass is, where it is, uh, it's really the two rare uh, signatures, the Higgs to ZZ to four leptons and Higgs to two photons that have had a very special role. And also because the mass resolution you come out with in the end picking out those final states and reconstructing the mass is of order 1%. All right, so here we try to represent some of the signatures in our detector. Uh, if you look, this is uh, kind of cartoons to illustrate what's going on. So Higgs to gamma gamma is on your left. Uh, what you see is when the two photons come out, there are many other tracks from other particles that were produced, but the two photons themselves don't leave a track in the inner layers of the detector and deposit their energy in what's called the electromagnetic calorimeter. In our experiment, it was those crystals. And we get 
uh, precise measurements of their energy and direction. In the case of Higgs to ZZ, to, in that one, E plus E minus, B plus B minus, you have the electron and positron, which have two tracks, and then the energy is absorbed in the crystals again, and you get, again, pretty precise measurements of the energies. Uh, then you have a pair of muons, and for the muons, you don't see them go all the way, but they leave a track inside, they go through the crystals depositing a little bit of energy, they go into the other layers, eventually they get to the outside, and you see these tracks outside going a long way, which are then bent in the large, the high magnetic field, and you get a good measure of their momentum. <coughs> and then you see uh, a Higgs in the third panel, a Higgs uh, accompanied by a Z boson. The Higgs, in that one, decays the way it really would like to most often, to a bottom quark and anti-bottom quark. The Z then goes to four leptons, E plus, E minus, or mu plus, mu minus, and it's those occurrence of the leptons that allows you to get some discriminating power. And then finally, Higgs to WW, you get leptons. Uh, you can get an electron. Each one is different, so an electron and positron, electron and muon, mu, mu plus, mu minus. And then because there are neutrinos, you also see that in the transverse plane, there seems to be some missing energy that the energy in the transverse plane is not balanced. This is just a blow up of one of the candidates. Now, the first thing to say, say, oh, that's a beautiful event. Is that a Higgs to gamma gamma event? Well, in spite of our best efforts, the ratio of signal to background is still rather small. You'll see that. So that's probably uh, a, standard model a standard model process that produces a, fair, a pair of photons. It's rare, but it happens, and it happens more often than you get the Higgs going to the pair of photons. So the analysis uh, at a high level looks simple. Look for two isolated uh, high energy photons coming out. And then we try to optimize the analysis by optimizing the methods by which we identify and measure the energies of the photons, uh, look at the properties of the entire event to try to boost the probability that this is a Higgs boson rather than a standard model production of a pair of photons. Um, and then also try to pick out events where the photons are very well measured, so you give heavier weight to the ones in which you think the energy is better measured, so you get better overall resolution. Then you have specific categories in the analysis for those other processes, the rarer processes, where the Higgs is, a, is associated with two additional jets in the forward-backward direction, the additional leptons if there was a Z or a W produced together with it, and so on. Uh, that's the thesis def defense of one of my students a few months after the discovery. Okay, so we worked on this channel actually for 20 years from the time of the superconducting super collider. And so we had many students over the years who contributed uh, to this analysis. There was a great emphasis on precise calibration for electrons and photons, optimizing the photon identification methods, how you set the energy scale precisely so that each event has the same scale so you can see um, a bump at a particular mass with a high resolution in a sample of events, and innovative analysis methods. Now, for today, uh, we can highlight the fact that among these many students, we had the first boosted decision tree analysis. So as time went on, hydrogen physicists finally got involved in neural networks, first uh, simple ones with, say, a single hidden layer. Uh, then this was uh, one of our students. It's the one in the lower left who's now at the Center for Naval Analyses. Some years ago, he came up with the first boosted decision tree analysis. And uh, since that time, uh, Maria Sparopoulou, who will talk here soon, and some of her students have also uh, developed special variables called the razor variables, which have helped with new particle searches. One of the next things that we're going to do, in spite of our best efforts and our previous um, conviction that we had optimized things, is we're now starting to learn that in many corners of our analysis, that deep learning approaches can make further progress for us. Okay, so when this is all done, this is again shortly after the discovery, you could see the little bump. 
that's actually quite a significant bump. And to illustrate it, you can see what it looks like unweighted. And then if you weight each one according to the ratio of signal to background that you've computed in your analysis, uh, what it looks like. Now, uh, actually, there was a person here, Josh, in the upper right-hand corner, um, who really has uh, applied uh, multivariate methods and boosted decision trees. There's actually here a flow chart of multivariate analysis, uh, components of the overall analysis to extract the signal. And so if you look carefully, you take the information from the detector, the clusters of energies and the crystals and the other calorimeter layers, the reconstructed tracks, the charge tracks, the momenta and direction, the, um, the energy deposited in the electromagnetic and hadronic calorimeters, and then you look at various aspects of the events. You look at the probability that the vertex configuration, if I look at the, um, the charge tracks and how the energy is recoiling against the charge tracks, for example, when, I'm, when I have two, these two photons, um, what is the probability of fitting the vertex? How well is the vertex um, resolved? Uh, how well are the photons reconstructed? There's a regression to optimize the, the single photon energy and uh, improve the resolution. There's a cluster regression to take the individual crystal energies and how you cluster them to represent an electron or photon in the crystals. Uh, there's a vertex probability, another multivariate analysis done to enhance the probability that you're looking at a Higgs boson production. Um, and then also there's a photon ID uh, part to boost the, the chance that this is a real photon. Then you start to put it together. Um, you extract the diphoton mass, you estimate what is the estimated resolution from the characteristics of the photons. Event by event, you get a resolution on the mass. Um, you also get an overall vertex probability, namely what is the position and the likelihood that it's a Higgs boson of the primary vertex. <coughs> then finally you extract a mass and properties of the, the Higgs, like its direction and other kinematic quantities. So there's a whole flow chart of multivariate techniques. Some are classifiers, some are regression to optimize values like the energy of the photon you're looking at. All right. Then, after doing all this, you still classify the output of, of an overall. This uh, overall is treated as a boosted decision tree. And then you categorize things. And that boosts the, that improves the discriminating power further. So you see we have four categories. You have one where the signal to background ratio is pretty high and the measurements are very good. Category zero, but there aren't that many events. And then there are other categories. Maybe the most powerful one is like the first category. And you can see that how the signal tends to move to the right relative to the backgrounds. The backgrounds can come just from the jets of particles, very rare uh, cases in which you get a fake you think that the jet, the jet includes two, the jets include two photons, and then also you get this standard model production of photons, which, you know, as far as the final state is concerned, are not really distinguishable. Except you can find the mass peak from the, the signal that you wouldn't see otherwise. So as time went on, this little signal emerged, and. Uh, also, I think, let's see, was this an era perhaps, just, this was just after the time. Before the discovery, we made this transition. We had this simple cut-based selection analysis. And then after that, we came up with this boosted decision trees, first simply, and then a whole flow chart of boosted decision trees. And it really improved uh, our ability to extract a signal with a given amount of data with a given significance. So. Uh, what I show from the sort of early days on the left is an era just before announcement of the discovery where in this one channel there was a four standard deviation um, emerging indication of a signal. Now, we look at so much data in so many processes that our community has come up with some standards or some 
de facto standards we use to distinguish signals from backgrounds. So when you see a three sigma effect, it means a three standard deviation effect, it's called evidence. And if it's five standard deviations, it's called a discovery. Now that's a global, what's called a global uh, three sigma or five sigma. Namely, you also have to take into account how many bins you're actually looking in. So there's something called the look elsewhere effect. And so, you know, seeing a fluctuation, even what looks like a five standard deviation fluctuation in a given region in one plot doesn't mean anything unless you take into account that you could have seen such a thing anywhere and you're actually sampling many bins. In this example, uh, we ran with a certain amount of data, uh, which is, in terms of luminosity, is about 5% what we have now. First, at a central mass energy of 7 TeV, now we run at 13, then at 8 in 2012. And at the time of the discovery, that's what we had. And we had a four sigma effect in this channel, then we had also, other channels had some effect, and taken together, it reached five sigma. And so then CMS and Atlas on July 4th, there was a seminar, and they both announced they had these effects, and then it was, <coughs> that was the discovery. By the time we finished the 2012 analysis, this was in the middle of a run, with about four times as much data, we had six standard deviations in this channel, and also, uh, uh, in, an, in the other channel, which I'll say a bit about, about it. About the use of these boosted decision trees, the net effect we saw was a boost in sensitivity by about a factor of 1.8. And we would have had to run about 80% longer for the discovery otherwise, which is um, you know, many years longer in the, in the long run. And for rare signatures, it's really crucial. So this is uh, what the bumps look like in CMS and Atlas. Um, at the end of uh, the first run, which ended at, at the uh, late fall of 2012, they each had a clean uh, signal shown here. And they also were able to uh, determine the mass rather well and check that the production rate was how it compared to the predictions of the standard model. And so this mu represents the relative production strength. It says, what is the production rate that I observe compared to what the standard model predicts? And you can see within these errors, which are of order 20%, that it agreed with the standard model. I just wanted to mention at least one of the other channels. This is uh, another type of event, a beautiful signature, where a Higgs goes to two Z bosons. The Higgs not, is not heavy enough to produce two real Z bosons. One of them is off shell, namely it appears uh, in the diagram for the process, but it, it's not, it cannot be extracted you know, as a free particle. It's called a virtual particle and that's why it's uh, listed as a Z star. Uh, but nevertheless, the final state is four leptons, mu plus, mu minus, mu plus, mu minus, e plus, e minus, e plus, e minus or e plus, e minus, mu plus, mu minus. So these are very distinctive signatures. And you can see a picture of, uh, of such an event uh, with the low rate, which I already mentioned. Now, when the experiments then looked across the various uh, production rates and ways in which things de decayed, and took all their signatures and tried to separate out what is the strength for each production mode? Remember, there's gluon gluon fusion, there's vector boson fusion, there's associated production associated with a, of a Higgs and a, a Z or a W, and, and a Higgs together with the top anti top pair. What is the rate of production compared to the standard model? You can see the error bars are pretty big, but overall it really agreed with the standard model. And if you combine the results from Atlas and CMS, you got agreement within about 10%. So all couplings are consistent with the standard model with a precision which is improving, but still pretty big, 20 to 60%. Observation of uh, five sigma, this uh, standard um, value we use where the probability of seeing a fluctuation from background only is uh, very low. We see it now in the gamma, gamma, ZZ, and WW boson channels. Recently, in the last several months, 
in our experiment, we've also made an observation of the Higgs going to a pair of the heavy uh, leptons, the tau particles, tau plus, tau minus. And both experiments have looked at the details. I'll say a few words about that, about the final configuration of what's produced in some of these channels, which are illuminating in terms of the properties of the decay. Um, and also shows that it almost certainly is a particle with zero angular momentum, which is what is predicted as the Higgs boson in the standard model. So within the standard model, I said that the Higgs boson couples to mass. So if you express it in just the right way, uh, you can show whether or not uh, the coupling really does follow the mass laws you expect, both for spin one-half particles, which are called the fermions, and for the bosons, like the W and Z, which have one unit of spin. And you can see the data points from Atlas and CMS on the left are following the straight line, which is what the standard model predicts. Question? A couple slides ago, I think it was the first time you had data in separate from Atlas and CMS. Could you comment on <clears throat> the arguments for the independence of, of those two? Yes. So. These are, um, each, each detector has, has certain strengths. These designs are actually quite different. So my experiment is called a compact muon solenoid. What does compact mean? Well, it is smaller than Atlas, but it doesn't really mean small. It means dense. And so we have a four Tesla magnetic field, which is very difficult. And for that reason, our detector is smaller. And we have all these crystals, which have high resolution. Atlas also has a high resolution electromagnetic calorimeter, but with a very different technology. Our muon system, um, you see, is between the layers of iron. And sort of the topology of the layout of the chambers is rather regular. In their case, um, they go out to much bigger volumes and have these muon stations in air. So there are many possible systematic effects. and uh, having two is really a very, very valuable cross-check. You also mentioned that for discovery on this level, um, it was not done with one experiment. It's when the two experiments had really uh, both reached the level of being able to announce the discovery, uh, that discovery was sort of put out there. Um, there are other examples which are perhaps more instructive. So before, in the same tunnel, before the LHC was the Large Electron Positron Collider, there were four experiments. And there we got lessons that we had one experiment that announced a few things that the other experiments said, no. And so there are, you know, given that you're so motivated to find something, you optimize your methods and you can eventually convince yourself that you have something. And uh, it's not part of my talk, but the structure is like this. So one way of doing analysis is you tune your selection criteria until you say, I'm going to have zero background. And so if I see one event, then that's a real signal. In other words, uh, you can imagine that you can calculate the probability of a, background, of a background event being 10 to the minus something. You know. And so if I see one event, they say, hey, that's a signal. But if you don't have a way to really check that, you don't. And in particular, there might be rare signatures in your background that you don't understand. So anyway, we've had counterexamples that showed the value in that case of four experiments. And we're very convinced that two experiments with very different designs are extremely valuable, especially when you have something like this, which essentially changes the course of your thinking. This is like a branch in the road. You don't want to take the wrong branch. And so it's very valuable that we have these two experiments. There's also a dynamic. If one experiment starts to come out with something, we haven't had this in a very severe form. We've had it in minor forms. And the other is very motivated to go after this and check. And they both work together and check. So it's a, it's a, it really stabilizes the scientific process. All right, I was here. Uh, so, what about the couplings? So, uh, clearly, as mentioned, the standard model predicts couplings to the different species and to which, into which it can decay. And so the different reactions give you different um, 
information in terms of the coupling. So to make a simple picture, we normalize all the couplings in these parameters, which are called the kappa, which is a ratio of the coupling uh, strength to that predicted in the standard model. The kappa v is the is coupling to vector bosons like the W and Z. The kappa f is assuming it's the same to all fermions, uh, such as the BB bar, quarks are fermions, or uh, the leptons like uh, tau plus, tau minus. And you see the different reactions give you different contours, but when you put it all together, the joint contour is really clustering uh, around one for each, which means compatible with the standard model. All right, so that was run one. And then in the last uh, couple of years, starting in 2015 and continuing to the end of this year, we've been running a 13 TV. Now, what's interesting about the higher energy is you can produce new things. And the advantage of producing new things gets greater the greater the mass. So you have this dynamic situation. You know, I have protons. Inside the protons, there are quarks and gluons. But they also have motion inside the system. So when I bring them together, I can produce heavier things. And the higher the energy of the protons, the greater the chance of producing heavy things. So what you see for starting at the top with the most common interactions, uh, 13 TV over 8 TV is only a, an advantage increase rate by 1.2. As I start to go down the rate of producing individual vector bosons, Ws and Zs, two Zs, it gets up to about an advantage of two. For the Higgs, it's an advantage of two to 2.5. For heavier species, like the top quark, it's uh, three to four. And then if there are new things, suppose we have objects which we don't know yet, which are several TeV. Remember, in these units, the Higgs is 125 GeV, or an eighth of a TeV. That the advantage is enormous for the heaviest particles. And so energy is really at a premium. And so 13 TeV is a new, a new opportunity to see new things. Well, uh, first of all, immediately we reproduced the Higgs analysis. Uh, again, we got extremely good uh, measurements. The mass is now determined, it was already determined to 0.2%. Now individual experiments are 0.2% or better. Amazing for a particle that was discovered so we recently how well we know its mass. And in this process, ZZ to four leptons, you can also see other things. So for example, there's the, the Higgs uh, which is sticking out as a signal over the backgrounds, uh, which is shown in this uh, sort of pink or red color. Um, and then the backgrounds, and there's a rare process on the left that's kind of an internal standard that shows us we are really reconstructing things well because there's a standard model process for producing four leptons, which is not the Higgs on the left. And so the background as well is well predicted. And also the kinematics, if you remember, you have one Z0, which is a real Z0, and so it has a certain mass, which is like 91 GV on the same scale where the Higgs is 125. But the other one's virtual, and so there should be a relationship between the mass of one lepton pair versus the other, and you can see it over there. And if you look at the, uh, the, the points compared to the predictions, uh, you, which is represented sort of vaguely as this gray background, which gets more dense near that position for the mass of one of these zeros, that it really does follow. Uh, then we did a lot more. Uh, we wanted to know whether this is a spin zero or something else. And so you write down the most general theory. This is an expression uh, in the upper right for a general expression for a spin two particle and on the left, the spin one particle. And now, if I look at the Higgs to ZZ to four leptons, I have a lot of information. So you can define um, the two, the lepton pairs can tell you there are two planes which are defined by those two pairs of uh, vectors. And you can look at the production and decay angles of these things and ask, you, ask yourself, what is most likely? And so for a whole range of models, there's one exotic model for each of these vertical bands. You look at the likelihood ratio between whether 
uh, the data that we have is more likely from a spin zero particle, a zero with positive parity, that's a zero plus, or something else. And so you see the likelihood JP. So it's a log likelihood that we're, ratio that we're looking at. And you can see that the data, when tested against uh, what we have, we test against the data, it always favors the, um, the orange or red bands over the blue ones, which are the alternative. So no, no matter what we test it against, there's a preference that this is the spin zero particle, like the standard model says. Well, so this is run two, one, and maybe a little bit the beginning of run two. This is what it was like. You know, this is not far from Geneva. But the point here is that we had this mountain in front of us, which is, you know, is the standard model working and can we complete it or not? And now we've completed it. But now a bit, we don't know where we are. So I gave a talk like this, a little different, at a conference in, um, in Manaus in the Amazon. This is the Amazon River. So now we're on a river of discovery. What does it mean? It means we don't really know where we are. We didn't find supersymmetry. We're looking for whether it's still may be true or what other exotic physics there is. We know the standard model is not all there is. The simplest argument for what lies beyond the standard model are here. First of all, we know that dark matter exists. In fact, it makes up most of the matter in the universe. And you can see that in the galactic rotation curves, the fact that there's excess mass that sort of binds the galaxies which are spinning at a certain rate together. You can also see that in uh, galaxy clusters and superclusters, you can see it in distortions in the light that comes to you when there's mass between you and the source of the light, so-called gravitational lensing, which sometimes produces multiple images and sometimes even, like here, seems to smear out some of the astrophysical objects, remote galaxies, in ways that can be explained by dark matter in the middle. And we also know that dark energy, dark matter and dark energy have key roles, that the whole shape of the universe as it appears, for example, the ratio of uh, clusters of matter and voids between them on the largest scales uh, would be different if we didn't have just about the amount of dark energy that we, that we have, uh, namely about 70% of all the energy in the universe is dark energy. But anyway, so dark matter is missing from the standard model. And the other thing I told you that's wrong is this. The Higgs mass is 125 GV. If you try to project back using uh, the quantum field theories that we know, back to the early universe, which is equivalent to projecting it to very high energy scales, you find out that the universe is not, the universe is not stable. Uh, is it unstable? Uh, not really, in the sense that the time in which it would transition from the vacuum we live in to something else, but we wouldn't be here, um, is much longer than the age of the universe. So there's a plot. The green is stable, the red is unstable, and the yellow is metastable. And the data seems to, in to indicate that we're there in the metastable re region. There's also lines which are fascinating. Those numbers, 10 to the 11, 10 to the 12, 10 to the 13, that's where the Higgs self-coupling becomes negative, which alternatively, alternatively interpreted, that's where if there's an intermediate mass range, something else happening, it may exist. And that seems to be in the range of 10 to the 10 to the 10 to 10 to the 12 GV. And remember, we're running in our experiments at 13 TV or 13,000 G. Harvey, perhaps this would be a good time to get some questions from the audience. Yes. So I had a question about the sensing that you have within the Large Hadron Collider. So when you have these multiple layers of you know, different materials, what do you exactly sense in those materials? Is it the temperature? Is it? Uh, so different layers are different. So for example, the trackers tend to be silicon detectors. When a charged particle goes through a silicon detector for every 30 electron volts that's deposited, uh, you get an electron hole pair. So essentially you're looking mainly at the electrons, which give you an electronic signal. 
in the case of the crystals, uh, they're called scintillators. So when a charged particle goes through them, or a photon goes into them, but then almost immediately converts into electron positron pair, then the result is light. The light in, in that case goes through the crystals and reaches a photosensor where the light is then converted to electronic signal which is then read out. And as somewhat similarly in the hadron calorimeter there are layers of plastic which are scintillator. So most of the energy goes into the heavy material which in that case is brass. But in the plastic, again, you get light, and then there are photosensors which convert it to electronic signals, which are read out. So, so most of it is photosensors, and there are a few other... Yeah, in the case of the muon chambers, in the forward direction, it's again solid state, like silicon sensors in the end. But in the central region, it's gas detectors. So how, how uh, accurate are the measurements? So if you see a photon hitting... In the silicon tracker, the typical uh, resolutions are of order 20 microns. In the case of um, the crystals, the measurements are sort of in the range of 1% for an energy, for high energy um, electrons and photons is what matters. In the case of the muon chambers, we depend upon this bending over a large bending radius. and it reaches, um, it's designed so that even for very high momentum uh, muons, because they could be very important as coming from new particles, new heavy particles, that up to about one TV, we still have a resolution of 10%, and it's sort of proportional to the momentum. So, okay. Um, in terms of jets of particles, for very high energy jets, it gets down to like several to 10%. But for a lot of the others, we have uh, resolutions of the order of uh, uh, 20, and in lower case, even 30%. But uh, what are the measurement errors? Uh, so are they like 5% of the actual measurement or 1% of the actual measurement? You mean in a single cell? Yeah, like, yeah whatever measurements you get. Well. But that's not important. The measurement error is not important. Yeah, let me take the example of a photon in a bunch of crystals. The crystal sizes are chosen so that a small set of crystals transversely will contain the energy. So they're long enough so that it's contained longitudinally. And uh, they're large enough, well, they're small enough so you can get a very good measure of what the angle is, but also large enough that just a few contain the whole thing. So a typical uh, set of crystals for a high energy electron or photon might be somewhere between 9 and 25. And uh, if the particle goes into one crystal right in the middle, 76% of the total energy is just in that one crystal. But then it varies. If it goes if it, at a different position, it gets shared. So we don't care so much about you know, what is measured in the crystal, but in this so-called physics object, this cluster of crystals, we care. And similarly, you know, we don't really care. I mean, the signal to background ratio in the silicon tracker is like 14 to 1. But we care to, to pick out from the pulse the position. Then we have a bunch of positions. We make our trajectory in space. The bending and knowing the magnetic field gives you the momentum. We care about the momentum and the angle. So we can measure the topology of the event through the angles at the production point and also the momenta. And so we get a kinematic picture and a geometric picture of what the event looks like. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. So um, you're trying to identify the signatures of the different ways that the eggs can decay. How accurately do you think you're identifying them? Um, you could see, you get a hint, for example, in that strength plot by channel. You could see that as the, so Overall, for the entire set of decays, we said that the, the strength you know, is getting measured the, to about the 10% level. Then if you look down at the size of the error bars, you see they're getting bigger. So we have a real ways to go in terms of, you know, can we pin down for every channel precisely what its coupling is? We have quite a ways to go. But I guess my question is more, you're like seeing this data, and you're trying to classify when these events happen. 
but there is these other things that are making the data a bit noisy. Yes. How, how do you know how, like, how often you're seeing something versus missing it from the noise? Well, I mean, essentially for each, so for each channel you have sort of likelihood of signal versus background. You have two main levers to check what you're doing. One is when you're identifying particles that go into the decision, you have certain processes that you know what they are and you can reconstruct the mass and say, you know, I understand those properties. In terms of um, signal versus background, you look at uh, likelihood ratios of signal plus background versus background, and you also extract the significance. The significance is expressed in terms of what is the likelihood that if I have no signal, I have a fluctuation which produced this apparent signal. And so we use that. And so there's been an entire um, development of the concepts of how you use the log likelihood ratios and also give a penalty when things don't fit exactly so that you have a, you have a, um, a measure which has what's called the right coverage, namely that you really have a good measure of the significance and you don't underestimate too much or over overestimate the significance. So to see the ways that I can point you to a paper that, that will tell you, you know, exactly what are the statistical methods and what are the properties of these log likelihood ratios and all the rest. You know, how do we know we have three sigma, four sigma, five sigma equivalent? And then also, as I mentioned, also look elsewhere effects. So there's been long discussion to make sure that we're not making any mistakes in terms of um, significance, um, suppressing fake signals, understanding you know, when you have a low enough probability of a fluctuation from background and so on. So that's my short explanation of a set of papers. Yeah. <clears throat> you mentioned that your computational methods have evolved. Yes. Uh, are they continuing to evolve? Very much. Uh, we, had a, we had a conversation between us along these lines. Uh, I probably, looks like I probably won't get to this today. <laughs> but, um, so what happens is you, you derive these methods um, for identifying certain types of things, like uh, a B quark, really you see a jet from a B quark. And people now, you know, for a long time thought they were doing as well as they could possibly do. And then when they started to apply deep learning methods, they said, these are doing better. Maybe at some stage before I stop, we should have a break. But before I stop, I should jump to that and show you some of that. It's like a whole community within a discipline, scientific discipline, has a certain maturity, has reached a point where they believe they're doing the best they can, then new methods come along and are doing better. And even the abstractions are abstractions we never thought would happen. Um, I have an example which is taken from a student working in our group, working with uh, Maria, um, of abstract <coughs> representations. Once you've identified particles by our standard method, you want to go from that to what is the origin of this entire event. And so you, you just put a geometric shape on the plane that represents these particles in, in the places where they are, you know, in terms of the angles, the two angles. One is proportional to the polar angle from the beam and the other the azimuthal angle. So you unroll that and you put these images there. And it seems to be doing better in distinguishing these types of events than anything that came before, even though we don't understand the abstraction. Are there particular papers you could point us to? On yes. The so uh, what I have in my slides, there's this uh, NIPS uh, conference. Mm -hmm. And so there were three papers there. I wanted to highlight two which are accepted as posters. And um, one of them has, has to do with these abstract images. And to identify, I yeah. I quickly mention this is also an area that like, they, we're also very involved with. Like, yeah. to, Another example I have is the Atlas Calogan. Yeah. So, um, so I came in touch with that. Uh, I, I was at the supercomputing uh, conference where I run these uh, large-scale exercises in networks. 
and we hosted a number of other teams and one of them was the Atlas team which took this uh, generative um, adversarial network uh, uh, generation of shower profiles at high speed and they did a demonstration there. And so I have in my slides some of that. But then I also noticed your, on your, um, your website, right? There's this note about, about GANs. In other words, you know, it's recognizing something. What is recognizing, we don't really know. We've been working you very hard uh, and working the audience pretty hard. Uh, maybe we should take a little short yeah. break. Minutes and then oh. we could wrap up yeah, I'll I'll jump to some of the uh, recent uh, work with deep learning methods. Okay, so we'll, we'll return at eleven twenty-five.